All right, now we'll talk a little bit about some of the different immunosuppressants you have to know for this exam. So this is something I did last year. Uh, I don't really think I'm going to be able to do it over the recording. I guess it'll work, but anyways, regardless, you know, uh, number one, what is uh, what is our agent that inhibits uh, calcineurin via cyclophilin? If you guessed cyclosporin, you guessed correctly. Yeah, it's a little bit better in person, better effect. Uh, so what is our agent that uh, through NF NKBP inhibits calcineurin? And that would be tacrolimus. Number three, our agent through NFKB and inhibiting mTOR is serolimus. Number four, what uh, sort of inhibits NFKB or Kappa B and then also inhibits uh, the transcription of inflammatory cytokines in different genes. Steroids or glucocorticoids. Five, IMP dehydrogenase inhibitor. That is mycophenolate. How about our PRPP amidotransferase inhibitor through 6-MP. Which one is that? If you guessed azathioprine, you might have gotten it correctly. And last but not least, we have one of our monoclonal antibodies, desclizumab, which uh, blocks our IL-2 or our leukotriene 2 receptor. All right. So sort of a big picture, how do you suppress the immune system? There are a number of different agents that can do this. Sort of our number one big gun are our corticosteroid glucocorticoids. Very good at what they do. However, as you'll see in the next few slides, there are a lot of side effects of using glucocorticoids, so we try not to use them long term. What we do end up using long term are our calcineurin inhibitors, which uh, inhibit uh, our T cells through uh, inhibiting IL-2. So we do not have T cell proliferation and activation because we're blocking IL-2 through a variety of mechanisms. Uh, we can also use anti-metabolites to stop DNA synthesis, so our um, immune, immune system tends to be very rapidly uh, uh, proliferating. So we can use metabolites, anti-metabolites, to actually in inhibit their immune system's proliferation. There are some cross-side effects because there are other cells in our body that are rapidly metabolizing, metabolizing as well and they're, sorry, rapidly proliferating as well, and they're not as specific, so you can have some side effects from these medications. There are other minor agents that we do use that are on this exam that we'll go through, some TNF-alpha agents and IL-2 receptor modulator agents and some even more agents that we'll talk about. So this is sort of a smorgasbord of uh, a lecture that we're going to try to condense for you. So starting off with the most important thing you'll ever have to know, corticosteroids. So the corticosteroid we're going to be talking about today is prednisone. So you can all, you can assume that most of them act in a similar manner. So it has a very big mixed mechanism of action. One of the things that comes up again on uh, step examinations is that it inhibits NF-kappa B. You also want to know that it can also inhibit phospholipase A2, which is an enzyme that actually occurs above, uh, if you remember from our last lecture with our COX-1 and COX-2 enzymes, uh, the phospholipase 2 actually is above stream. So that's why with corticosteroids you have even more uh, inflammatory, um, anti-inflammatory action. It can also... Uh, 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 inhibit uh, TNF-alpha, and finally, uh, it also can cause uh, leukocyte adhesion, so or inhibit leukocyte adhesion. So you'll actually see increases in patients' white counts who are getting high dose steroids. Uh, so what are steroids used for? I mean, they're used for everything. In this specific time, we're talking about uh, acute organ transplantation. They can be used for chronic rejection. However, you know it's not beneficial because if you see on the right hand of our slide. There are a lot of side effects that can occur. In addition, some other things that we're going to be talking about throughout the year, rheumatoid arthritis, MS, asthma, COPD, gout, irritable bowel, severe allergic reactions, and many, many, many more. 
So steroids are sort of used for everything and they have like this wide breadth mechanism of action. It's extremely, extremely important in the high yield to know the side effects of steroids. So obviously if you're giving somebody a steroid, they can develop the disease that occurs when you have too much steroids in your body. So you can get a Cushing-like syndrome. Steroids also cause hyperglycemia. They cause hypertension because of their effects at uh, uh, increasing the body's sensitivity to their uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine. They can cause osteoporosis. If you're reducing the immune system, you can obviously cause an infection. They can lead to ulcers, glaucoma, depression, psychosis, and there's you know there's even more on this list that I'm not mentioning. But you know, there are a lot of things that uh, corticosteroids can uh, cause. Finally, one of the more important points is uh, you can actually cause the HPA axis suppression. So, uh, you know, you give somebody glucocorticoids and then their, uh, uh, I believe, ACTH and CRH, the, the uh, releasing hormones from the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary actually sort of stop, uh, stop being secreted because the body induces a negative feedback. So it's very important after you give uh, corticosteroids for longer than 10 days, usually even, yeah, longer than 10 days, you need to taper the dose it down. You can't just immediately stop because your your uh, hypothalamus and your anterior pituitary are no longer secreting uh, releasing hormone because the the negative feedback. All right, uh, calcineurin inhibitors. So we have two here that are very important. Number one is cyclosporine. You'll see cyclosporine used a lot. It's one of the main agents used for maintenance of chronic rejection. Uh, so it is a calcineurin inhibitor and these work by actually blocking uh, T-cell proliferation by preventing IL-2 transcription. So in this sense, IL-2 is our major driving stimulant in um, the proliferation and differentiation of T cells by blocking it, we uh, are, you know, are inhibiting our T cell response. So it is used for prophylaxis of organ rejection, and it's also used to treat graft versus host disease. Very, 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 very important to know that uh, cyclosporine is highly nephrotoxic. It can cause hypertension and it can cause hyperlipidemia. Very important to remember uh, those three side effects. In addition can cause some neurotoxicity, it can cause gingival hyperplasia, which is actually just a uh, swelling of your gums, and uh, hirsutism, which is a uh, hair growth. Very We highlighted the first three, but it's very important to know all of those side effects for cyclosporine. It also has a very small uh, therapeutic window, so, uh, you know, I mean, the, the drug has to be monitored. Uh, I do believe maybe monthly, monthly levels are drawn, uh, maybe less than that. It's just it, it's it's important to remember that uh, you have to keep it at a certain level in the body because if it dips too low, you can have infections and go into acute rejection. And if it goes too high, you can have some side effects. Finally, uh, there are a lot of drug drug and drug food interactions with cyclosporin, so it's uh, you know a little bit more pharmacy side. But this would sort of be the drug that you would see in a question stem, and then they would add an inhibitor. And you would see that, uh, you know, maybe the patient goes into acute rejection or they're having side effects. Very important to remember. Cyclosporin is, it's acutely acted upon in drug interaction. Another calcineurin inhibitor is tacrolimus. This isn't directly inhibiting calcineurin. It's working on another way. It actually binds to FK506, which is a, a binding protein, also known as F-kappa-B-P just sort of like a whole bunch of alphabet soup that you have to remember. But in reality, the way tacrolimus works is it's blocking T-cell proliferation again by preventing IL-2 transcription. Uh, similar to cyclosporin, it's used for organ rejection prophylaxis and uh, it can treat graft versus hosts. So the sort of the difference between cyclosporin and tacrolimus is uh, tacrolimus is a lot more neurotoxic and it actually can cause uh, diabetes, so there's more hypoglycemia. So that's sort of the, the major differentiation between these two is cyclosporine. You have to worry about nephrotoxicity mainly, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia, whereas with tacrolimus, it's diabetes and uh, 
neurotoxicity. And uh, furthermore, there is no gingival hyperplasia or hirsutism with tacrolimus. Finally, our last calcineurin-like inhibitor is serolimus. So it's very important to remember serolimus is not a calcineurin inhibitor at all. It's an mTOR inhibitor. So again, it's sort of working in the same fashion of binding NKBP and inhibiting T cell activation and B cell differentiation by preventing IL-2. But it's not doing this through calcineurin, it's doing it through mTOR. Very important to remember. Again, used very similar things, prophylaxis of organ rejection and treatment of grass versus host. The additional sort of high yield from your lecture is it can be used for kidney transplant rejection prophylaxis. That's sort of just uh, something you want to uh, burrow in your mind. Serolimus, kidney transplant uh, rejection prophylaxis. Oh, I'm sorry. Finally, uh, uh, it can cause pancytopenia. Very important to remember it can cause pancytopenia. It does sort of have that uh, insulin-resistant uh, hyperlipidemia profile that uh, tacrolimus and um, cyclosporin had, but it's uh, also important to know it is not nephrotoxic. Uh, sort of the, another one of the major differences between uh, cyclosporin and tacrolimus. And another interesting fact, I'm uh, not totally sure about this. It, it was in your lecture and it was sort of a practice test question, so I'm including it for completeness, but in reality, I'm not sure I've ever seen that before. But it can cause some uh, tolerance, apparently. Patients who are on serolimus long-term do require dose ex uh, escalation because um, uh, you know, you body becomes tolerant to the effects of the drug. So this is sort of an, uh, an odd agent, fingula mode. It's, an, uh, it's known to sequester lymphocytes in the lymph nodes and pyres patches of uh, the small intestines. Uh, I wouldn't give this, I wouldn't say this is the most high yield drug. Historically, it was used in transplant rejection, and you should know this for the test, but uh, in real life, it's actually used for MS in some cases. Wouldn't spend too much time on this drug. Uh, you know, I think the mechanism is pretty interesting, sequestering lymphocytes and lymph nodes and pyrus patches. I would know that, and you can use it to treat uh, transplant rejection, but I wouldn't spend uh, too much time worrying about it. So some anti-metabolite drugs. These are uh, very important. You will see these drugs again in future lectures. So isothiopreme is our first anti-metabolite. So this is actually metabolized into 6-mercaptopurine, a purine analog, which is then incorporated into DNA and uh, causes the DNA synthesis termination. So it's used for quite a wide variety of uh, different conditions, rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, glomerulonephritis, and other, of course, what we were talking about today is transplant rejection. It has a few side effects that are uh, quite strong, myelosuppression, and uh, very important to remember, hepatotoxicity. And that is because it has uh, the highest of the high-yield uh, interactions with allopurinol. So allopurinol, as you'll soon learn, inhibits xanthine oxidase, which is part of your, you know, your purine metabolism pathway. Now, if you inhibit xanthine oxidase, you're going to have a lot higher levels of azothioprine, which can be hepatotoxic. So if you're giving a patient, let's say you have a patient with gout, and all of a sudden they get a, uh, uh, I don't know, a kidney transplant, and you decide to put them on isothioprine, you know, their, their levels of azothioprine are going to be quite high if they're concurrently getting allopurinol, and that can lead to hepatotoxicity and all those other things. So you do want to remember these two. It's a very, very commonly tested uh, interaction, azothioprine and allopurinol. Another commonly used drug in transplant rejection is mycophenolate. So this inhibits our IMP dehydrogenase, which is again part of the uh, purine synthesis pathway. So in our rapidly dividing B and T cells, inhibiting purine synthesis would leading to in the inhibition of DNA synthesis, and so B and T cell levels will drop. So this is another one that's used chronically for transplant, and it can actually also be used for lupus. Uh, the big thing with this is uh, they can be uh, pancytopenic, can cause some GI upset, 
lead to some hypertension and uh, hyperglycemia. They tend to be a little less nephrotoxic and neurotoxic than some of the other agents we had already talked about today. So now we're going to move on to some of the monoclonal antibodies that are being used. So the first ones we're going to talk about are the anti-tumor necrosis factor or the anti-TNF alpha agents. So these are very important. Again, you'll see these throughout the rest of the year. So uh, the three we're going to talk about today are infliximab, sertolizumab, and uh, adalutumumab. I'll say that again for you. Infliximab, sertolizumab, and adalimumab. So these bind and neutralize TNF-alpha. Uh, they're used, again, as these immunosuppressants are in a wide variety of different conditions. Uh, irritable bowel, uh, RA, anilocene spondylitis, and uh, psoriasis. Not really uh, much in transplant. Some different side effects. It's all sort of related to TNF-alpha. So obviously if we're suppressing the immune system by suppressing one of the strong uh, cytokines, we're going to have some immunosuppression. Extremely high yield is uh, you can get reactivation of TB. So the TB, uh, the macrophages, that cause the walling off of the TB bacteria in our lung require TNF alpha to uh, to function. If you give a TNF alpha inhibitor, the uh, macrophages actually lose their ability to keep the TB walled off and um, calcified. So, in all patients who are going to be going on a TNF alpha inhibitor, they need a baseline TB test to be sure that there is no uh, you know, any old TB resting in their lungs that is waiting to be reactivated because we are blocking the TNF-alpha. So that's a very, very high uh, yield, very important concept to understand. TNF-alpha is required by the macrophages to wall off bacteria in our lungs, specifically microbacteria, TB. So uh, all patients who start a TNF-alpha inhibitor require a baseline TB test. Uh, a few more reactions because we are giving uh, an immunologic agent like uh, an antibody for the most part you can have some reactions to the drug when they're infused lastly uh, intercept so or sorry a tenercept this is another sort of TNF blocker but it's it's a fusion inhibitor it's not a monoclonal antibody it's a uh, it's a TNF alpha receptor on a sort of decoy uh, agent so when this drug is given, it, it doesn't bind like an antibody binds. It binds the TNF-alpha, and then once it binds, it actually is sort of precipitates in the blood. So you're sort of taking the TNF-alpha, and you're precipitating out of the blood. It does not bind like a monoclonal antibody binds. That's what I meant by it does not bind to TNF. So just for some more information, you know, those past couple slides, the, at least the last slide with the crazy names on it with uh, the drugs, it can get a little confusing at times as to why in God's name they, you know, named monoclonal antibodies like they did. Hopefully this can clear some of it up. Unfortunately, not all antibodies go by this uh, uh, nomenclature, but, you know, it can be helpful. So uh, is it human? So through the history of creating these monoclonal antibodies, we at first, you know, used a mouse, and then we were able to use some that were, you know, partly mouse, partly human, and, you know, as our genetic technology got better, we were able to make recombinant, fully, 100% human antibodies. And so, if you see a, uh, a, a, a name and it has an O somewhere, that means it's a mouse. If you see an XI, that means chimeric. Chimeric means that 80% of it is human. Uh, humanized, which is 90%, is a ZU, and 100% fully human has a U in it. So I'll show you an example later. Uh, in addition, uh, so actually, we'll just go back now. So infliximab has an XI, so infliximab is a chimeric. Sertoluzumab is a ZU, so that is a humanized, so it's not about 90%. And then finally, adalimumab has an MU, so that's fully humanized. A couple more examples. You can actually sometimes guess what the drugs are used for by different uh, uh, things in their name. So 
for cardiovascular acting drugs, they actually have a CI or a CIR in their names. And so bevacizumab is a VEGF inhibitor and uh, abcizumab is another one. So these use, are used uh, for cancer agents and they act on blood vessels and this one uh, uh, works on uh, platelets. Sometimes you can tell if they work on immune system, have an LI or an L. So infliximab has an LI, adalimumab has an LI, and those were both uh, TNF-alpha inhibitors. And some that are used in cancer may have a TU, so trastuzumab, as you'll learn about later, and rituximab. So you can say trastuzumab is a uh, monoclonal antibody that works on tumor cells of some sort that is uh, humanized. So, you know, it sort of explains why they named certain things the way they did. So a couple of, so now we're sort of getting to the little, uh, little, I don't know, the, the other category, some of these other agents that are used that aren't the highest yield, but, you know, you have to know them for your exam. So first we talk about the IL-2 receptor antagonist, Dazclizumab and Baziliximab. <laughs> so these are actual IL-2 receptor antagonists. They block interleukin-2 receptors on T cells. So by blocking the interleukin-2 receptor, you won't have T cell proliferation. These are adjuncts in transplant and they tend to be used with uh, steroids or cyclosporin. They can also be used for MS. And uh, I guess if anything, the only side effect I would worry about is that they can lead to infections because you're blocking the immune system in a way. Uh, and then we have Adolescue kin, aldeslukin, you know, it's just, you know, we just don't see these drugs used at all. Uh, so this is the opposite. This is an IL-2 receptor agonist. So this increases the T-cell proliferation because we're, you know, actually directly stimulating them. So in this case, it, it, these can actually be used uh, in cancer because we're increasing the body's ability to detect and respond to cancer because we're, we're actually activating T-cells and making them hypersensitive. They have been used in uh, malignant melanoma and renal cell, car or renal cell cancer, and it, oddly enough, they can lead to hypertension. I would uh, sort of associate this with if you're stimulating the immune system, it, you know, may lead to, uh, you know, sort of a shock episode quicker. You know, you may be quicker to recognize uh, IL-6 around and, you know, you get into some sort of a sepsis. Regardless, I wouldn't worry too much about this slide other than a few of the things that are bolded. Getting even more low yield, uh, we just have a, a few more agents. So this is Mirmomimab. I guess this was the actual first monoclonal antibody that was ever created. And it uh, binds to the CD3 glycoprotein on T cells. And it's sort of uh, an inhibitor in the sense that the CD3 binding site is always near the TCR, the T cell receptor. So if it binds to CD3, it just like stereo, uh, it, it, it like naturally just blocks the T cell receptor because it's it's so close and it's the monoclonal antibody is so big that it just like, you know, the T cell receptor can't work. So, you know, take it for what it is. It can be used for prophylaxis and uh, Acute organ rejections, it's not used much anymore. I wouldn't worry about this drug at all. Just, you know, keep it in your mind. If you have an extra neuron, you can try to remember something, but I, I doubt a question would be asked about this. Uh, similarly, uh, we have the Rho D immunoglobulin. So this is actually, you know, specifically used for hemolytic disease of newborns or urethroblastosis vitalis. So this is when we have a pregnant female with Rh positive blood who, oh sorry, Rh negative blood who gives birth to a baby with Rh positive blood and then there is, you know, the hemolytic reaction because the mother's uh, antibodies are sensitized if she's already had one baby with the Rh positive blood and then the second baby uh, suffers from the disease. So in this case we're just uh, giving an antibody that is blocking the uh, response of the mother's blood. And uh, just a few growth factors. So we have uh, uh, epotin alpha. So this is literally a erythropoietin analog. And we all know that erythropoietin causes uh, red blood cell proliferation. It's sort of the uh, hormone in our body that takes care of that. 
So it can be used in different uh, types of anemia, renal failure, uh, and cancer chemotherapy when our red blood cell lines dip too low and uh, other chronic inflammatory conditions. Interestingly, a uh, very high yield side effect, it can cause uh, hypertension and uh, it can cause some myeloproliferative disorders because if we're giving a hormonal agent to increase the red blood cells in our body, you know, we could possibly uh, cause a little bit of a leukemia. Another one very important to remember is uh, granulocyte stimulating factors, which work on our white blood cells, philgraspin and uh, sargramostin. So uh, philgraspin works on the granulocyte colony, whereas sargramostin causes uh, growth of granulocyte and macrophage. These are primarily used in chemotherapy-induced neutropenia, and uh, you know if we are increasing some of our proliferation of our different cell lines, you can get some bone pain. We keep getting lower and lower yield. These are a few things that are on your list that I'm going to give you like one or two line facts. So BCG, BCG is just our attenuated strain of mycobacterium. It's part of the uh, vaccine for tuberculosis that you get in, uh, you know, primarily Western Europe or just Europe in general. So if you and I'm sure some of you and some of your classmates might have gotten this disease, uh, this vaccine, and this is why, you know, you have to continuously get the chest x-rays and you become positive for uh, the TB test every time you get it because you receive this vaccine. Uh, thymic factors, so, you know, patients with severe, uh, severe combined immunodeficiency, SCID, can be given thymic factors directly to uh, promote T lymphocytes and uh, stem cell differentiation. I, you know, I wouldn't worry about this one at all. Finally, we have interferons. So these are the um, cytokines that are released from cells when they notice or when they become infected with a virus it's to sort of alert the cells around them to uh, make changes because they're infected. So we use interferons for herpes cell leukemia, Kaposi sarcoma and malignant melanomas. I wouldn't worry too much about that. Some interesting side effects. They can lead to depression and neutropenia. If, uh, if you get a question on this exam, I would just know that interferons, you know, they literally interfere with viral protein synthesis to stop viral proliferation, and they can lead to depression and uh, neutropenia. Side note, this is a uh, slide from a future exam, but it's sort of laying the groundwork that, you know, interferon alpha is used to treat uh, viruses and cancer, beta is used for multiple sclerosis, and gamma is used for uh, chronic granulomatous diseases, but you don't have to worry about that quite yet.